Thank you for joining us this evening for the Artists Exchange, a group created by and for artists to share new work, ideas, resources, and opportunities monthly over a glass of wine or tea as you prefer. So grab your beverage and join us as we discover the work of two Bay Area artists, Sherry Carver and Lauren Elder. I'm Shelley Rugg, the Executive Director at Gallery Route One and co-producer of the Artists Exchange. For our presentation today, we ask that you please stay muted unless asked to unmute. For best viewing, select speaker view from the top right corner of the Zoom viewing screen. We want you to know that we are recording today's presentation for future viewing on our website and YouTube channel. Now, please join me in welcoming our co-host and co-producer, Pamela Blotner, an East Bay artist whose sculpture and drawings reflect on humankind's relationship to wildlife, climate change, calamity, and healing. Blotner's art has been exhibited in Europe, Asia, Africa, and throughout the United States. She has taught at a number of universities, including the University of Chicago, University of San Francisco, the San Francisco Art Institute, and Pixar Animation Studios. And in 2017, she was appointed a US Arts Envoy to Burma. Welcome, Pamela. Thank you. Thank you, Shelley. That was lovely. OK, well, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, two very interesting artists, mixed media artists, Sherry Carver and Lauren Elder. And each make artworks that, that are recognized for their remarkable originality and complexity. Um, each of them share and demonstrate an abiding interest in the ways in which we humans relate to each other, coming together, intersecting, and pulling apart. Okay, um, um, let's start with Sherry. And this is going to be a, a brief introduction to her because she's going to be talking about her own work. Um, Sherry Carver has worked with a variety of materials, beginning with, beginning with clay, moving into oil paint. And finally, uh, her work has, has developed into mixed media photo and oil-based paintings. Um, she, she says, I have always been interested in how people relate to one another. And um, especially in our fast paced metropolitan areas, how do we find our own identity and our own distinct voices as we strive to tell our own unique stories? So um, if you would be so kind, uh, let's see. Um, Sherry, Sherry, would uh, you go ahead and start your slides? Well, thank you. Thanks, Pamela, for that nice introduction and, and thank you all for being here. So I wanna just tell you a little bit about myself before we get into the images. And uh, some of you have known me from way back, but not all of you have. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago. I'm an only child and my parents were Holocaust survivors. So art was not really important in our family, uh, but inadvertently, my parents did help me become an artist. My dad was a tailor, so we always had little bits and pieces of fabric in the house that I would sew and make things out of. And my mother worked for a company that made the little square paint chips that went on brochures for paint companies. And she would bring home all the extra ones and. I always joke, I was probably the only six-year-old that knew what aubergine was or chartreuse. Uh, so those were my early beginnings. And I also had the opportunity to attend the Art Institute of Chicago children's classes on Saturday morning. And the school at that time was in the basement of the Art Institute and the school started at, at 9 a.m. But the Art Institute didn't open to the public until 10 a.m. So as the students arrived, and I was always the first one there, the guards would let us go in by ourselves. And I, I walked through the Art Institute alone 
and it was kind of semi-dark because the lights were just coming on and it was kind of cool because they didn't quite have the heat on. And I was surrounded in this sort of semi-darkness with these wonderful paintings and sculptures. And it was really magical. You know, it was just a wonderful experience. And I did that when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Can you imagine nowadays letting kids walk through a museum all by themselves? So be unheard of today. So I feel very, very lucky um, that I had that experience. Somehow though, I got sidetracked by the time I got to college, my parents said, well, you have to study something where you can make a living. So I majored in sociology. Okay, Shelly, can we start the first image, please? So I started um, as in a sociology major, but my senior year, I had the opportunity to take a class in ceramics and that literally changed my life. Uh, I became hooked on the material. There was something about the tactile quality of clay and being able to make something functional and or beautiful out of just this lump of clay. And I was, absolutely mesmerized and taken with it. Uh, and after graduating from Indiana University, I went back to Chicago and I opened a pottery shop uh, under the Morse Avenue L, which was like the Bart and the trains would roar overhead. And I had the pottery shop for a number of years um, and it was wonderful. Uh, but after a while, I felt that I really wanted to teach. And in order to teach, I had to go back uh, and get my MFA. So I went to Tulane. Next image, please. And I graduated with my MFA and then I moved to California following jobs, teaching first at San Diego State, then at Chico State, and eventually ending up in uh, Oakland at Laney College, where I taught for over 30 years. But when I got to California, my work became uh, much more abstract ceramic work, uh, although I still did you know, some functional. And these are wall pieces. And I started to get back in touch with my roots and my background as a child of Holocaust survivors. And even though I didn't want to do very overtly Holocaust work, uh, I always started to incorporate things like railroad tracks and numbers into these uh, aerial views, I call them, uh, of my ceramic pieces. And I, I did many of these uh, for a number of years, but I always felt something was missing. Next image, please. And what was missing for me was the figure. Um, I somehow felt that I needed to put the figure into my work. And I started to do much more related Holocaust things. This uh, is a series called the Survivor Series. And uh, they're almost life-size figures that hang on the wall. Uh, and I did many pieces like this. and. This was like in my 20s and 30s, because I really did not know about the Holocaust till then, uh, because my parents never spoke about it at home. Um, so I was just learning about it. And I think after doing these pieces for a number of years, I sort of worked through this uh, and moved on. So next image, please. So I want to talk a little bit about the technique and some of the ideas behind uh, these works. Um, this one is called New Horizons. And what inspired the technique for this piece and the ones that you just saw uh, was a story I heard about uh, Kabbalah, which is Hebrew mysticism. And the story says that before the world was created, uh, there was only God or goddess energy out there, and there wasn't any room for creation. So vessels had to be created. And of course, in my mind, they're ceramic vessels, of course. Some vessels were created to contain the energy, uh, but either there was a cosmic accident, or maybe the Big Bang, or the energy was so intense that the vessel shattered, sending broken shards and sparks of light throughout the universe. And it is our job as humanity to separate the sparks from the shards and to reconstruct this, thereby going back to wholeness. Uh, and when I heard that story, I started to shatter and hammer apart all of my pieces. So I would fire the ceramic pieces, the first firing called a bisque, after you take a hammer and smash them apart to get all these individual pieces that you see here. Um, and then I would hand paint with acrylic paints on each of the pieces. 
and pit fire them in sawdust uh, to get these dark smoky areas. I don't know if you can see this with my little arrow here that I'm pointing out, uh, to get the carbonization. Uh, and that was a technique that I ended up using for um, all the pieces in ceramics. Next image, please. I also did a series about animals um, based on a book by James Baylog called Survivors, because I realized that uh, animals were also endangered and were having trouble surviving, just like human beings. And in this series, things started to change in that I started to leave out sections, like this whole area where the animal is, is not clay. I just painted that onto the wooden board that all the clay pieces are adhered to. And so each subsequent piece, I would leave out more and more of the pieces until eventually I was just painting on the board and there was no clay uh, at all. And right about that time, I got my first computer and Photoshop and I was taking all my own photographs and things just gradually evolved uh, and switched to the next series. So next, please. So this is, of course, a more recent piece. Um, and this is part of my identity and perception series, where I was taking photographs in public places, Grand Central Station, right here, one of my favorite places, um, and using Photoshop to uh, put together the composition. So not all of these people were there at the same time, uh, but I would add some people, I would take some people out. Um, and this area in the back, back here that is kind of pale gray, uh, I would blur out some of the figures and this represents for me, the passage of time, you know, people that have been in this very same spot, uh, maybe five minutes before I got there or five years before I got there, or maybe they will be there five or 10 years in the future because we're all on this sort of si same time continuum, even if we're not aware of it at the moment. And I also started to write little stories, little narratives, like in this guy here on, um, on the right, the guy here in the yellow hat, the woman in the back, this woman in the front. Uh, and I just started to make up little stories uh, based on how I thought the people were or what I thought they were into. I think I've always been a people watcher. You know, when you go to a cafe or you're riding on the train and you see people and you start to wonder, well, who is that? What do they do for a living? Uh, do they have a family? Where are they from? Uh, and so on. Okay, next image, please. Uh, I also started to incorporate uh, vintage black and white images that you see here on the left uh, with my contemporary pictures. Uh, and this again shows the passage of time, you know, people that have been in the same place years before us and how we connect with the past and with the future. Next image, please. So the surfaces on all of these pieces are resin pours. So here you can see me doing a resin pour in the studio. Uh, I kind of look like I'm probably on a hazmat team. Uh, but if you're ever going to do a resin pour, you have to make sure to wear goggles, a mask, gloves. You have to be totally covered up um, and, and do the pour. And then I pull these pieces into a separate room to try to keep the dust out of them. Um, and that's how I do the resin pour. So next image, please. I also photograph a lot on city streets. Um, and this is in Paris. I especially like this woman right here who was like a fake Marilyn Monroe trying to be. Um, uh, cafes in Paris, London, uh, Prague, you know, wherever we happen to be. And so I'm going to read you uh, what I wrote about this woman right here. Uh, and you don't have to put your glasses on because I'm going to read it to you. So next image, please. Okay, so this is how I pictured her. And this is what I wrote. Uh, that she's a biology professor, divorced twice, has finally found her match, even if he's a few inches shorter and teaches philosophy and thinks that mitosis is a happy hour drink. Hopes they'll get married sometime soon, but not until his 30-year-old son moves out. 
wishes she could relive the days when she used to be the lead singer in a band called Hillary's Pantsuits, but then got booted out for not being able to carry a tune. But to this day believes it was because she wouldn't get cozy with the drummer. So I try to you know, keep it real, but I also try to always put humor in because I think we need a lot more humor in the world. And I always try to say something that might be a little bit embarrassing that they might not want people to know. Um, so anyway, that's how I, I make this up and that's how I write these little stories, usually in third person, once in a while in first person. The next image, please. Um, and here's a piece I did um, on City Street in Paris. Again, all these people were not there at the same time. Uh, I put some in, I took some out, um, both little stories like on this guy here in the middle and on the girl on the bicycle and this guy here on the right side. Uh, and, and this piece relates to uh, the series that I'm gonna show you in a moment. This piece is called, what is this called? Um, don't you have the title of it? Okay, no, I do. At the bend in the road, 38 by 42 inches. And again, it has the resin coating. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you the last series. Next, please. So this is from my Missing Pieces of the Puzzle series. And you can see how this piece relates to the one I just showed you. It's actually the same street uh, in Paris, but different people. So, when COVID happened, uh, my husband Jerry and I got really into doing jigsaw puzzles because we weren't going out very much. And Jerry really got into doing them. I think he's done like probably over a hundred of them by now. And what I noticed when he was doing them is when they were about half done or three quarters done, they were much more interesting uh, because they had pieces missing. And I got the idea of having my own images made into puzzles. And so there's various companies in China, one even in Bratislava, that will make a puzzle from your own images. Um, and this one is called On the Path to Remembrance. And so when I get the, the pieces, they come in a box, there's about a thousand pieces, Jerry puts them together, and then I start taking them apart. And it's really about, you know, during COVID, we started to feel like we were missing things. You're missing uh, seeing family and friends, missing going out, missing traveling, um, eating in restaurants, going to galleries, and so on. Kind of the universal missing of things that I think um, people feel maybe even all the time. You know, things we take for granted, we really started to, to miss during COVID. Uh, next image, please. This one is called Escaping Shadows, 24 inches by 36 inches. Uh, and it was taken at Grand Central Station. And uh, I paint the backgrounds with oil paint and then I do the resin pour on them. Uh, next image. This one is called Tracing the Paths of Our Ancestors. Uh, and this is at Grand Central Station, uh, also 24 inches by 36 inches. And one more, next please. Uh, this one is called Convergence of Earth and Sky, 28 inches by 28 inches. And it's in the Fashion Galleria in Milan. And that is the end of my presentation. So thank you so much for all of you listening and being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sherry. That was, was lovely. And it just uh, always, always, it doesn't never, it doesn't amaze me, but it's lovely seeing how rich your pieces look both in life, but also projected that way. It thank seems you, that Gamble. every time I see them, I see more. Thank you. Um, does anyone have we will, uh, we will talk, we'll, we'll all get a chance to talk with both artists, but does anyone have anything to ask before we go on to Lauren? Yes, just quickly. Um, thank you, Sherry, that was just brilliant. It was wonderful to hear. Oh, thank you. And um, one of the questions, I hope you haven't had to answer this too many times, but how many people in those, in the paintings, in, the, in, the, in your work, have actually 
come up to you and said, do you know that that's me? And part of that is actually true? Or is <laughs> Thank you for that question, Shelley. Luckily, nobody has ever said that. Um, and, and I'm glad you brought that up. And I think the reason is because I change things a lot uh, because of Photoshop. I'm able to make, you know, somebody with blonde hair, have brown hair. You know, I'm painting. I mean, I'm using oil paint. I can put one person's head on another person's body. Uh, I change the color of their clothing. So it would be pretty hard for people to recognize themselves. Um, but maybe someday somebody will. Who knows? <laughs> Thank you for that question. I never realized you were putting people that weren't really there in your images. That's just <laughs> fascinating. And um, I'm wondering, oh, I've lost, I've lost my thread. Uh, well, well, thank you, Vicki. Yeah, I'm just, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm, I'm wondering um, how, um, how long it actually takes you to create one of these. If you're doing so much manipulation, it must take forever. It does. <laughs> it does take forever. Um, you know, the reason that I add people or take people out is because no composition is perfect. You know, when right. I take the photos, I'm photographing, you know, like hundreds of photos really quickly. They're, they're never that great. You know, I mean, I'd be lucky if, if one was, but they usually aren't. So I usually do have to add people, take people out. Uh, I probably work on it for about a week on the computer, mm -hmm. about a full week. And then I print it out in black and white. And then I start the painting process. And that takes a while. And then I do the resin pours. And then after that, I do more painting, probably beginning to end about a month, month and a half to do them. Mm -hmm. But I'm working on maybe two or three or four at the same time. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that question, Vicki. I, can I ask a question? Sure. One, one more and then we'll move on to Lauren. <laughs> okay. Um, I am wondering when you're working on the screen, how you select the scale. And because the scale can be so significant. And um, how do you choose what should really be on two large panels and what might be you know on a much smaller scale mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's and, a good question stephanie um because so, you know you're seeing it so much smaller mm -hmm. yeah um yeah that that's a good question um part of it is that i'm limited by how big i can go on one panel and do the resin pour mm -hmm. so that you know, it, it's kind of a constricting thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I really can't do it uh, as bigger than maybe 38 by 50 on one panel. Uh -huh. So that sort of determines it, whether I do one panel or two panels. Uh -huh. uh, I just try to vary them. You know, I don't want everything to be the same size. Uh -huh. You know, good question. I don't know, come <laughs> on over. We'll talk about it more. <laughs> That's right. Thanks. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. We we are going to move on to okay. to uh, our next artist, and it's going to feel like we're moving into a different country, and in a way we are. Lauren Elder is a community-based artist who works with environmental themes and whose own curiosity has initiated her interdisciplinary approach to public, what she calls placemaking, fusing her experiences in sculpture, theater, landscape architecture, infrastructure, uh, uh, water and, and agriculture into larger works. Projects developed from a deep community, commu community uh, collaboration in a process that does not separate life from making, life from art. She's also a Spanish speaker and works throughout Latin America and the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, please, um, let's welcome Lauren. Well, hello everybody. Thank you um, so much for sharing your evening with us. I really appreciate your being here on the day after Valentine's Day and I hope you all got a good dose of affection yesterday. 
Um, I want to thank Shelley for a really lovely presentation, so graceful and beautifully organized. And I'm going to have to ask everybody's indulgence. I'll be primarily reading mine because I tried to pack in a lot and I came in a bit late to the process. But um, it's conversational in tone, so we'll just roll along. When people used to say to me, oh, you're an artist? What kind of art do you make? Are you a painter? I used to choke up. There were just too many elements to be able to explain something quickly and conveniently. But after five decades of work, I think I'm finally able to give a concise description without too much fumbling. But it wasn't always so. Next, please. If I were to map my path, it would look like this image on the right, the Orinoco River, headed for the sea, certainly, but with some major gyrations en route. I had no pre-existing blueprint for where I would end up. On the left, the image might describe an artist like, let's say, Zakir Hussein, the Indian classical tabla master. He was handed his instrument, his repertoire, and a cultural milieu at birth, and moved straight ahead although he was able to take liberties later in life. I had to figure it out step by step. Next, please. So given the 10 minutes, I'll stick to the core values. One, nature, first, last, always. In the summer, we would ride bareback to the river and urge the horses into the current to swim. When your knees hug a large animal surging through the water, there's no room for doubt. We are inextricably part of nature. Two, I find much satisfaction in making things that are not only aesthetically pleasing, but functional for humans and animals alike. And three, I get positively squirrely after a week alone in a studio. I am at my best when I am in live exchange with others. Making together creates community. And for me, that's a delicious experience. Next, please. I'll skip over my first five years of exhibiting after graduation from the fine arts program at UCLA. I found the studio to gallery process really unsatisfying, even though I was making sales and getting reviews, something was clearly missing. In 1973, I moved from San Francisco to Berkeley and rented a studio behind a performance space launched by the unique and visionary Margaret Fisher on the far right. Fairly soon, I was derailed, mesmerized by all the living, breathing, singing, shouting, squirming activity going on in the theater. This was it. By osmosis, the performers began to invite me to contribute visual elements to their shows. I was making sets, props, and costumes. Next, please. A big turning point came in 1977 during a convening of some 80 artists on a pristine sand spit off the coast of Baja, California South at one of the calving grounds for the gray whales. In retrospect, I call it wet man, a precursor to burning man. It was an extraordinary explosion of creative energy. Nina Wise, whom I had met at Cat's Paw, was among the group. She gravitated to the structures I was making with materials thrown up by the tides. She improvised. I shot photos. Next, please. And a creative partnership was born that lasted until 1984. Next, please. My personal favorite of our works was Collision, staged with actual cars inside the parking garage of the Oakland Museum. It was a prescient examination of our fatal attraction to the gas-powered automobile and all the pleasures and heartaches that relationship has entailed. Next, please. 1985, another big turning point. I had returned from a stint in the UK with Welfare State International, a stunning multi-arts performance company, and I was in a state of flux. Sarah Shelton Mann, choreographer extraordinaire, invited me to a trial project with her new crop of rowdy young performers. Beyond their breathtaking physicality, they were artists with burning questions. 
I was with the ensemble for another eight years. We toured internationally and left a visible mark on the culture of movement theater. The piece on the right, Mira One, was a signature work with large box of ice speared by flowering tree branches, and they melted into the soil as the work was in progress. Next, please. During the same period, I was also able to produce some of my own environmentally situated performances. The audience moved from scene to scene, so everything was in motion. Several contraband members generously contributed their skills. In these pieces, I was searching for the possibility of transforming what I called the habit of war, even if it were only a change of values at the personal level. Keith Hennessy from Contraband is front right and Norman Rutherford middle, and they guided the men's initiation ritual. Next, please. This is the penultimate scene of Off Limits that took place at West Fort Miley in San Francisco. The angels of light and sound turn slowly inside rings of fire and gonging ensues on the periphery. Next, please. Surrender, the succeeding piece continued with the same themes and it too was bookend by, bookended by the use of fire. It was staged to great acclaim both around and inside the cavernous theater Arto in San Francisco. I was given permission to build a piece in the space for the entire month of December, which was a rare privilege. And we could build sets within sets within sets. And the cast just kept growing and growing <laughs> to my astonishment. People kept showing up. At any rate, next please. After leaving Contraband, I began receiving commissions from other companies. Out of the 60 plus pieces, I'm sharing a few that feature natural materials. Jose Navarrete and Violeta Luna of Naka Dance explored the scarcity of potable water in their home country, Mexico. First, I experimented with salt. Next. And later for the bigger version, we used dripping water in the abstract profile of an Aztec temple. We collaborated on the costume for the Aztec god and goddess of water. Next, please. Randy Pove's exquisite orientation featured seven female archetypes in a deep dive into the pleasures and pains of love. I made a kinetic sculpture of flowering branches and feathers. Next, please. 2002, the river takes another big bend. I was just completing my California Arts Council residency with Peralta Elementary School in Oakland. The parents asked me to stay on and to transform the asphalt of the prison-like play yard into a multi-purpose garden. Next. The project continued until 2006 when we had encircled the entire school with plantings and children's art. Next. These fabulous steel sculptures and gates were fabricated by Amy Blackstone and installed by the parents. So these were done in very close collaboration with the children. They were not my designs. They were their designs that I made practical. Okay, next, please. 2008, my first invitation to Latin America to create site-specific projects with local host communities. Nashira is a woman-run eco-village outside of Cali, Colombia. The single moms earn the right to build their own home through sweat equity within the cooperative. And a variety of artisan designers were commissioned to co-create their social space. The piece on the left is mine, and it was made uh, with the local timber bamboo, which is known as guadua, and it's a fabulous building material. Okay, next, please. 2012. This was the first year that North Americans were invited to contribute to the Havana Biennial. The exhibition was spread all over the city, bringing art to the people via laundromats, cinemas, and empty stores. 
I was hosted by LASA, the Artistic Laboratory of San Agustin, who operated on the far edge of the metropolis within their own neighborhood of public housing. They had transformed an incomplete industrial building into the island's first contemporary art museum. That's in air quotes. Ironic. My US collaborators were book and wheel works. Together, we created the pop-up cafe for the museum by forming relationships with local growers. I worked with local families to prepare appetizer dishes that featured fresh fruits and vegetables in a California Cuba fusion. So on the left, you see one of the cooking groups. And on the right, you see children looking at a map of the farms in their neighborhood, which were actually kind of a, a, a well-guarded secret up until then because um, agriculture was state run, but the government at that moment was experimenting with the possibility of allowing individual private enterprise and taking 10%. Okay, next please. My association with this project in Northern Mexico began just last month. So it is very much a work in progress. It is being hosted by the renowned spa Rancho La Puerta and engineered by Equilibrium. It's a facility that produces compost, irrigation water, and methane generated, generated electricity via biodigesters, which you see lower right, and the installed wetland uh, upper left. I am working on proposals for architectural embellishments and interpretive panels for public viewing. So what you see in the middle slide are the workers demonstrating the installation of the hood in one of the biodigesters and it captures the escaping gas and funnels it inside the building where it passes through a series of filters and into a generator. Okay, and finally, currently on view at Artworks Downtown San Rafael is this collaboration with Extinction Rebellion East Bay. The project began in early 2020 and continues today. I approached XR with my desire to make paper mache tombstones to honor the thousands of animals passing out of existence. We collectively created dozens of pieces that have been deployed at street demonstrations within the El Cerrito Cemetery for an online video and in multiple exhibitions such as this one, EcoArt Envisioning Strategies strategies and solutions. Uh, and the show will be on view until March 25th. And that is the end for now. So thank you for um, galloping through this with me. And I'm happy to take questions now or later. Well, first of all, thank you, Lauren, that I know how hard it was for you to, to encapsulate what you've shown us with everything that you do constantly. And so thank you. Oh, well, I appreciated the opportunity. Okay. <clears throat> Amazing. <laughs> okay, any questions from, from our viewing audience? Because if you don't have one, I do. No? Okay. Hi. Okay. Ah, yes, please. I'm interested in your collaborations and how they work and how you find people and, and do you do you, is it all part of a big community or is every one of these collaborations separate and individual? Each one is unique. Each one is absolutely its own animal, its own community. Um, uh, just as a for instance, the school gardens resulted from the fact that I had a California Arts Council residency at a local elementary school. And so I was part of that school community. Um, the very last, the next to the last one that I showed, the um, uh, Blackwater Treatment Plant, they found me um, by a, a mutual friend who's a plumber and an artist and uh, had been invited there to do a gray water installation. And so she introduced me to the community. So uh, Lauren, have you collaborated with Andre Thompson? No, I have not. 
No, oh. we we're uh, quite friendly, but oh, and, you're quite okay. Well, yeah, <laughs> Sherry and we're in Weed, but we're not um, collaborators. Yeah, well, because I know that she's connected to a lot of eco art, and so I was wondering. I was just curious. Well, and she's actually. I I take that sure. back. She asked me to come critique at her classes in the past. She's here. Yeah. Oh, so okay. I, I, I'm glad I um, remembered that. Well, um, to, to piggyback on that question in a way, um, when you were still working with the performance groups and doing more indoor work, um, and other many groups began to invite you uh, to create with them. I mm -hmm. was wondering, did you, um, I know you did a little bit of both, but did you start out choreographing or writing or, or doing another kind of development of ideas that they then picked up? Um. Well, we had we had a lot of public visibility with our work with contraband, and I won a number of awards as a result of that. And so, um, when people came to see the shows, they were always sort of like, "Whoa, <laughs> that's interesting." Um, and that's where the invitations came from. You know, people would invite me to come in as a set designer, and uh, I did show two out of the three pieces that I authored, uh, Off Limits and Surrender, but the rest of the time I was working as a scenic designer. Oh, okay, so, so the pieces that you authored, you of course brought others in to work with you, yeah? Correct. Okay, and how did you start that collaboration? Um, well, as I, I believe I mentioned in the um, presentation, uh, some of the uh, co-creators were members of Contraband. Right. So for instance, sections of the piece that needed choreography, I asked Sarah to do that, um, or Keith. Um, sections of the piece that needed music, I asked Norman to produce that. I had ideas, you know, I said, I'm hearing polyrhythmic percussion in this section, but I don't know how to produce that. Can What do you want to come up with? Um, by that point, we contraband itself had a pretty large following. And so we just put the word out that we were um, inviting participation and folks just started showing up. It's great. Uh, some of them were students, some of, I mean, students of the group taking class. And some of them were just community members who said, wow, count me in. Any other questions? Um, I just want, I was just going to mention that um, we're, we're, it's open Q&A time, so you feel free to ask or uh, comment about either of our artists tonight. Seemed like some people had questions earlier and they didn't get to ask. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question for Sherry. I put it in the chat, but now I'll say it directly to you. I think I understood that your puzzle pieces, they're actual 3D in the sense, they're real puzzle pieces that are glued down. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's yeah. absolutely correct. Yeah, we have them made and they're just like regular yeah. puzzles. Mm -hmm. Great. And then, and I was wondering if in your mind, there's a relationship to working like that as you were working in clay with your um, uh, mosaic, I'm going to call it mosaic, sort of pieces. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I've come yeah. full circle. I think yeah. I, I was going to say the same thing. Yeah, I, say the I, same I thing. didn't realize it until I was doing it. Doing it, I yeah. Think there's definitely a correlation and relationship to my past work, which is really interesting to me because I never thought that my ceramic work was going to relate to, to what I do now. But yeah, there, there we are. It is. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to thank both artists. I thought I knew everything about Sherry's work. I've known her for years well. 
And I learned so much tonight. I was just going, whoa. I went running out when you were talking. I told, told my husband to come in and watch because I said, this is like amazing. Because we both thought we, we, you worked pretty well. And also, I did not know that much about um, Lauren's work. I knew some. I loved all the collaborative aspects. When you said that you get squirrely in your studio alone and need to collaborate, I go, wow. What you've done with a collaborative effort is amazing. I just so enjoyed learning about it. So thank you both so much. It was great. Good. I, I just wanted to um, ditto that because I know both of you quite well in terms of like your art for a long time, but you both did a great job of encapsulating in a very short period of time, a very long arc. Um, which is not an easy thing to do. I mean, you both have very interesting arcs and fascinating, but again, they're not linear, or I should say it's not a simple um, line. So, and then related to Lauren's work, just because I've also been involved in theater, that that was such an incredibly fertile collaborative period of time that um, when contraband was going on and there were other things too that the Bay Area had just there was an amazing scene and I think any of us who kind of were able to experience that it's definitely you know filtered into our work and Lauren you didn't mention the fact that you actually at a certain point went back and did um you know, through UC Extension did a, a landscape architecture program so you could position yourself more into being able to do the outdoor environmental stuff. And that's fabulous. So I just kind of wanted to add that in, but. <laughs> I just wanted to add this beautiful presentation from both the artists and Sherry, I saw your work in 2008 in your studio. If you remember, I came with the NCWC group but that work was different. You didn't mention that work here. That's what I felt. I remember you coming to the studio. I remember that. Well, I have done many different series. And because this was such a short presentation, I couldn't do everything. But yeah, I remember those website, paintings. Yeah, see it I like these, your puzzles, puzzle paintings very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And great to know that you do collaborations, Lauren. I didn't know much about your work, but definitely appreciate it. Thank you. It was, it was wonderful for me, to, Lauren, to hear and see the the extent of the work you've done. I've known about you for for years. I, I also was in the dance performance community during that period. And it's just so nice to have the the puzzle pieces of your work fitted together for me. Really exciting. <laughs> Oh, good. Um, I had a question for Sherry, actually, if I may. Sure. <laughs> um, I'm fascinated about the work done um, of people in public spaces. Are are there no um, privacy issues about photographing people in public space? I've always been timid about it because I wasn't <laughs> certain what what I might be getting into. And I wondered what your experience had been. Well, it is perfectly legal to photograph people in public spaces. You know, I'm not peeking into anybody's bedroom windows or doing anything like that. But yeah, if it's public, it's okay. There have been lawsuits about it. Um, and the artists have always won. Um, it's fine, really. I, I, I talked to a lawyer about it many years ago when I first started, because uh, I, I was concerned about that too, exactly what you're saying. I, I was concerned. And um, the lawyer said a couple of things. He said, it's, it is okay as long as you're not, like I said, peeking into somebody's you know private home. Um, he said, it has to do more with money, believe it or not. Uh, people will sue you if they think they're gonna get money out of you. They're not going to get much out of me. Maybe an artist like Jeff Koons, you know, who's multi-gazillionaire, people will sue him if he does something like that because they're going to get money. Also, if you're just doing one-of-a-kind pieces, which mine are, that's considered okay. Uh, it might be different if you were doing like a calendars or postcards where you're printing millions of them. 
then it might be problematic. But for just one of a kind pieces, go for it. It's okay. Uh huh. Because uh, um, I've had people get very aggressive with me when they saw me photographing, let's say, in an outdoor market or. Um, I can remember an instance in Guatemala where I was just photographing a food display with a few people standing around it. And the woman said, I want you to give me some money. She thought I was going to go make a calendar who do who knows what um, to, to profit from her stall. And I said, I mean, I gave her some money, but I said, no, no, you misunderstand. I just, I think it's beautiful. And I wanted to photograph it. So that's one of the reasons I asked. And I yeah. love that they invented histories. <laughs> and also, you know, I try to be discreet about it. Um, you know, I don't get right up into someone's face. You know, I have a lens that extends. And, you know, so I try to be a little bit further away from people. I, I only had one person one time say something to me. I was inside of a cafe and I was photographing people across the street. And there was a window washer washing the, the windows of the cafe. This was in New York. And he came in. I don't know what country he was from or you know, anything like that. And he said to me, what are you photographing? I said, I'm photographing those people across the street playing with the dog or something. And he goes, oh, OK. He goes, I was worried you were photographing me because in my culture, if you take a photo of a person, you're stealing their soul. I said, OK, no worries. I am not photographing you. And I totally respect that, you know. That was the only time anybody ever said anything to me. Okay. I'm gonna jump in here um, because we are getting near the end of our hour. And um, before I go on, I just wanna first really appreciate this awesome audience. Um, thank you for showing up and all your questions and comments. It's been very lively. And uh, that's, that's exactly what we hope for yeah. on the Artist Exchange. Um, so I'm going to move us into our op artist opportunities and resources um, part of our program. And um, for that, we'd like to open the floor to anyone who wants to share any artist opportunities, ideas, resources with this group. Uh, um, this could be, you know, a great show to go see, uh, a grant. Um, I see a hand waving, Andre. Um, oh, no, I just wanted to say uh, how wonderful this was and that I, I'm sorry I missed the first part of it. Uh, these are two incredible artists and um, I really appreciate this presentation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I will continue here. If you, it, you can just raise your hand or you can just speak or you can use the um, raise hand icon. Um, and um, just to let you know, if you're interested in presenting as an artist at a future artist exchange event, you can send an email to Pamela. It's PamelaBlotner at gmail.com. So does anyone have any other things they'd like to share with our, our artists here? Yeah. yeah, I wanted to just invite you all. I have a solo show coming up. Oh, really? San Ramon. Um, it's a Lindsay Drix Brown Art Gallery, and uh, I'm presenting there different series of my um, paintings, which are about oneness, um, the universality of all, you know, like we are all connected. That's the theme, and I call it We Are All One. So I really appreciate if you all can come, I can send you the invite. And um, it's on 4th of March uh, in the afternoon, 3 to 5 p.m. And of course, there are two other exhibitions, group exhibitions are there. One is um, Bay Area uh, Figurative Art in uh, Livermore. I'm, I'm participating in that. And there's one in uh, Davis, where it's a really nice show with all women artists. Um, it's about uh, not California women artists today, tomorrow, uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You know, it's in the celebration of uh, Women History Month, March. So there are quite a few shows coming up. So I'm excited, and uh, I hope 
I can send you the invite and I can I can place the invite in in the group. Um, which I, is, I have it, Selma, and I can okay. I can share it with them. Okay. okay. Yes, I did. If yeah. you if you have a way to put a link in the chat, you could also do that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to share that the uh, gallery route one is looking for new artist members all the time and our application period in for the next round ends March 31st so it's coming up and um, I'm going to put a link in the chat if you'd like to learn more about that. Uh, and talk about the fellowship. Talk about the fellowship. Um, well, we have a fellowship program where um, we offer artists a stipend to have um, to become a part of, of Gallery Group One for a year and have um, a couple of shows, be part of our member show, um, have opportunity to sell in our alcove, and um, just all around um, be part of our gallery for for a year and be supported by not only the, the money, but by a group of artists that have a lot of resources to offer. That's amazing. And um, we're actually working on um, updating our brochure right now. So um, that opportunity will open up uh, very soon. Sounds very generous. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, cool. a, it's a great opportunity, for, especially for emerging artists who, haven't had a whole lot of experience um, exhibiting their work. It's it's a really great opportunity for that. So if you know That's anyone, really, send them on. Yeah, sorry. That's really part of our mission, education and helping, helping grow young artists. Uh, do you want to do you want to go on or shall I? Well, I do want to mention that we do have an opening this Saturday at Gallery Route One um, from three to 5 p.m. Our juror, Jer Jeremy Morgan, will be there to present awards for the juried exhibition. And it's called Seen and Imagined, which basically covers about everything. <laughs> so, and it's a huge uh, show. There's like 79 artists that have are participating in the show and the work will be throughout all our galleries. Um, so we'd love to see you come out for that. And also um, we're trying to raise money for artist exchange. And so I'm gonna put a link in the chat so that um, if you're interested, you can make a donation. Okay. All um, right, anything else out there? Any good shows to go see? Lauren. Um, <clears throat> Amalia Mesa Baines is having a large retrospective over here at the Berkeley Museum of Art, which nice. I think is well worth seeing. And I believe I mentioned it in my presentation, but if you happen to be in San Rafael, uh, the gallery um, Artworks Downtown has a really excellent show on eco art that was put together by Deanna Pindell and it just opened a week ago. So it's yeah, a I there. Show and it's quite quite yeah. rewarding. Yeah, I want to go there. Okay, well, um, I want to remind everyone, if you don't know already, that we we did record. We have been recording this program, and it will in a couple of weeks join our archive. And uh, we welcome you coming to our archive at um, let's see, um, gro dot um, it's galleryroute1.org. Dot org. Okay, and thank you. Under under the programs tab, you would look for the artist exchange, and then you'll see all the videos from past shows. I think there's one that we weren't able to save, but um, but yeah, it's a great resource. And it's where we've been we've been around for longer than a year, so it's almost a year and a half's worth. Okay, so. Um, thank you so much for coming. And, and as, as Shelly said, you've been wonderful. Your questions, your involvement, it's very gratifying for us. Um, and I hope that you come, we hope that you come next month on March 15th, when our guests will be 
uh, two artists I haven't met, Nanisha Dungarwal, an Indian American mixed media artist, and she will be in conversation with um, with um, um, Reiko Fuji, who is a Japanese installation book and video artist. Mm -hmm. And um, after that, we have a line. We have someone lined up. Two people lined up for April. One of whom is here tonight, Ms. Vicki Gunter, and she will be. Um, a she will be partnering with um, Elizabeth Addison. So please put that on your calendar as well. And I'll be talking about a new gallery that is going to be opening in Benicia. Um, oh. So come find out about it. I'm gonna be in the opening show. All right, all right, okay. Well, thank you all, and um, you can get in touch with us through through Gallery Route One, or through let's see, Shelly, your email is um, is Shelly Rugg at at Gallery Route One dot org, and right. as you know, I'm Pamela Blotner at Gmail dot com, and uh, any suggestions, any ideas, any comments, we would love to hear from you. Thank you again. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela and Shelly and Lauren and all of you wonderful guests who came. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. We'll see you next time.